But I want to welcome everybody. I want to welcome Ron for coming. And again, I uh, wish we had a bigger audience. But um, Ron has a, um, an interesting program he told me about. And I think anybody that has anything to do with passenger cars uh, can, can appreciate this. And um, I think it'd be worthwhile, definitely be worthwhile for me. And um, it's basically about upgrading pasture cars for better operation. And I'll let Ron get into that a little deeper. But uh, Ron, um, if you would like, you can uh, go ahead with your presentation. And um, I'm sorry, what is your friend's name that's helping you? Eric. I'm sorry? Eric. Eric? Oh, OK, good, thanks. Uh, so Eric and Ron, go ahead and take it away. and. Uh, uh, Terry can help you if you have any questions on getting set up for Zoom. I'll just hand it over to Terry. I'll just all start at me moving the pivot point on the truck was uh, way back in the 60s when HM Burke brought out their 80 foot passenger cars. At the time, my railroad wasn't built yet, I was working on it. So I used to take them to my friend's house and he had some tight races. So I'll take the train over there and try to run it. And I used to use the uh, MHP diaphragm, if you know what those, that was the rubber ones. So I thought it was the diaphragm. So I'd bring the cars home, rip the diaphragms off, put on new ones, take it back over there, they still derail. So then we're looking at the cars and the end of the cars was sticking out so far over the track that the couplers wouldn't handle the curve. So, cause I always body mounted all my couplers. I didn't use telco trunks. So I says, oh, well, let me take it home and I moved the bolsters. So that's what I did. And I had to stick these in, saying now it's my favorite railroad. So this is, this is about the length of my passenger train. Erie at the time ran a lot of head end carts. So I usually have more of those almost than a few passenger carts itself. It were, Ron, we're still seeing you now. Were you thinking we were seeing something else? Yeah, you're not. Okay, Terry, do you want to help him set up? Stop moving your mouse around. I hit share screen. Oh. Yeah, that's all that needs to be done. It came up with an error. I didn't see it because I was remote today. Can you guys see it now? No. Should be down at the bottom of the screen, almost in the middle. Just slightly to the right of the middle. It'll say share. I guess I shouldn't have given you his name, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a Zoom error. It's giving me a code. I'm trying to look it up while it's not taking it. Um, Ron, it is on your computer right in front of you? Yeah. Do, well, do you see a, it says share screen at the bottom? Well, he's got it on his, so he's doing it all. It's what? Zoom's acting up. Hold on. Uh, yeah, he said Zoom is acting up. Yeah. I'm going to try showing from my, because it's um, not letting me. I'm going to step away for just a minute. I'll be right back. Well, anyway, you could hear what I was saying, right? Yeah, no problem. Um, one one uh, question that's burning in my mind before you start your presentation. Does this at all change the radius of uh, cars or the radius of track to run the cars once you make your modification? Oh, you mean, the, yeah, yeah, you can run a tighter radius. I, I ran them on 24 inches and have no problem. And that's all body mounted couplers and everything. That answers my question. Thank you. So then I'm, uh, I'm gonna join the audio, I'm hanging up on you. Okay.
because what it was is that uh, one one area on my main line is like 27 and a half inches. So I measured it after I moved to pivot points. I gained like an eighth of an inch that the cars were closer to the center of the rail. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Eric. Okay. Yeah, I, I went to share screen on his and it gave a 105.025 um, error. So now is it showing? Got it. Okay. Yeah, it was just I was remoted in and it was given some kind of error. So let me know when you want me to change the slides, Ron. Oh, I don't see it. Oh. I, I'm seeing it just fine. It says yeah, reworking I'm, I'm, fashion. I'm definitely recovery. seeing it. Stop We're moving definitely your seeing it. Ron, stop moving. There we go. Well, now. Yeah. Okay. So when I go? Yeah, you can go. Okay. Well, anyway, you had all of this stuff here. Okay. Flip to the next one. Anyway, like I was saying earlier, this is basically my my passenger train, the way I run them. Uh, Erie ran a lot of head in cars, milk and everything like that. So a lot of my trains have like seven or eight head in cars and maybe two or three coaches and that uh, Pullman's. Next. And this is about a normal passenger train on my way out. Uh, those are F3s. Erie, and when they first bought passenger units, that's what they bought was ABA sets of passenger trains, F3s. Next. And this is the stuff that uh, I do on the cars, move the pivot, move the pinhole, body mount the couplers, check the wheel gauge. I do all of this before I ever even put anything on my railroad. I check the coupler heights, Check the side slot in the truck because that, that has a lot to do with cars, even though people don't think about it. Because 90% of the cars you buy, the axles are tapered, right? So if the axles are tapered and the wheels are sloppy in the truck, the car will shift one way or the other on the side. So if you're pulling the car, the car will pull to the inside. It'll lean over. Well, it's already on its way, ready to fall over. And if you push it backwards, it's going to push to the outside. And check the truck motion. In other words, you want to make sure the truck rocks forward and backwards and side to side. A lot of times that has a lot to do with the operation too. You think the car is coming off, but actually the truck isn't set and dead flat and it won't let it rock forward and backwards. Next. And this is, this is about, this is what I did when I first body mounted the couplers and moved the pivot point. This, I took this picture probably back in the 60s sometime. And what I did with, these are AHM cars. And you can see the difference. AHM uses a 38, 33 inch wheel, but I put 40 inch wheels in all mine. And then I took the truck and turned the truck around, cut off the Telgo mounted truck and moved the pivot point. And that made a big difference in the operation. Next. And this here shows you the difference of how much it will move. And what the difference is, is, if you look at the pivot point on the bottom one, the truck only goes about almost to the center sill right there. But if you look at the one where I moved the pivot point, see how far the truck moves to the back instead of the front. So when it pivots, it gets the center, the end of the car it keeps it closer to the center of the rail. But the bad part, when you have a car that's all detailed, you have to grind away all of that stuff in the back to the center of the truck right there. I don't know if you, I don't know if you can see that or not. Anyway, next. And this is what I was talking about, the distance between the cars after and before. The one on the left was before I moved the pivot point. And the one on the right, you can see there's almost an eighth of an inch difference 
you can see how much closer the couplers are to the center rail compared to the one on the left hand side. And if you got tight radiuses on your railroad, <clears throat> that'll make a big difference, especially some of these cars you buy with diaphragms that hook up to each other. Next. And this is how I do the Walther's trucks. I start out with a piece of styrene, which is 80,000 thick. And I grind away the back part of it so that it'll clear the old uh, bolster and everything. Then I just, I make them all up so they're a certain length. I move the pivot point. It don't seem like much, but it's about a half an inch we end up moving. I try to get it as close as I can to the axle of the, of the, outs, the outside truck. I mean, outside wheel. Next one. Like I say, this don't take a lot. Uh, this is the dimensions that I came up with for doing that on a Walther's truck. I thought Walther's trucks were pretty easy to do it to because being a quarter inch wide, it fits right in between the two screw sides. And what I was worried about when I was doing them is moving the pivot points so far to the outside of the car that the truck wouldn't stay flat on the rail. But I find I have no problem with that whatsoever because the weight of the truck will keep it down. I weigh, I'm, I weigh all my passenger cars up to about five ounces. I don't go much more than that. Because I found that if I have a lot of side slop in the truck, that makes a big difference is how the car runs. So I make sure I don't have a lot of side slop in the, in the wheels on a side frame. I did that with my freight cars. I changed all the trucks on every car I owned to either Atlas or Lifelike. Back then, I said it changed like 500 pair of trucks. And Rob, uh, huh? Uh, how do you take care of the slop on a passenger car truck? I, I'll, I'll find a different wheel to put in them. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Because back then, when I was doing it, they didn't have all these wheels like they have today where you can buy wheels with different lengths of axles and everything. And a lot of times, if I can't get that to work, I'll pull the wheels off of the existing axle and put them on a different axle. Okay. Seemed like a lot of work, but I figured, well, you know, I don't want the aggravation of going down there and running my trains and putting them on the track every five minutes. That takes all the fun out of it. And I don't run anything with Telgo on the trucks or anything. I'm not on my passenger cars or my freight cars or anything. Like that coupler right there, even though it shows that it's still hooked up when I was all done, I took all of that stuff off and body mounted the coupler so it can move. Any questions? Okay, no answers. Next. <laughs> This is this is what you have to do. A lot of guys don't. I left the screw in there because that holds the floor on the wall for the cars. But you have to grind all of that off because of the way the truck will swing now. You know, it used to swing in the middle, so the truck stayed basically the same on both ends of the truck. But once you move it to the outside, the truck swings more to the inside of the car than it does the outside. So you have to grind all that away. Me, I, I don't care. I'd rather have the operation than the good looks because I'm not entering in contest or nothing. And I use a 256 screw when I drill the hole for the new bolster part. Next. And that kind of shows you how it does. If you can see what I was talking about, where the wheel on the inside, see how much that swings there? So you have to grind that away or the truck will hit it. The wheel will hit it actually. And sometimes what I'll do on those two is I'll, when I put the screw in there on the new pivot point, I'll take and cut off a little piece of spring just to keep the tension on there. But you don't want too much tension because that truck has to walk, you know, back and forth. And I'll take the new bolster sometime and I'll just round it off a little bit. Next. And you can get the cars closer together too, you know, closer to prototype distance. When you body mount the coupler, you just move the coupler right a little bit further inside. 
Good question, Ron. Huh? How tight is that radius? That radius right there is 27 and a half inch. And I try to stagger my rails too. I never put them on so they're straight across. Because what it'll do, if you put them side by side, is you always end up with a kink. And I always used to do that because when you buy a model railroad or anything, what do they tell you to do? They always tell you to cut the ties off, put your rail joiner on there, then put the ties back in. What you've done there is you end up taking away all the strength to hold the rail in place. So guys that hand lay track, what's, what do they do when they lay their track? They always stagger the rail. So my buddy Joe Coss has hand laid most of his railroad. So I was like, well, if you can do it on this, why can't you do it on flex track? So any place I'd have problem with a kink, I'd go and cut off a section of rail, probably five inches, and I'd slide it back in there, and that would get rid of the kink on both rail. So now anytime I lay rail or anything like that, I always stagger the rail to at least two to three inches. And, and I never cut the ties off. I'll take and I'll take and file the eye at a rail. Because if you look at a rail, it's always sheared. Well, when it shears it, it always puts a burr on the eye. So before you try to put a rail joiner on there, go file the eye a little bit and the rail joiner will slide right on. Because if you don't, you're trying to push the rail joiner over that burr. Anyway, that's what I found out. So, next. And this is a ro uh, torpedo car. And these are a little bit different because they got more detail on the bottom. So you really have to grind a lot of stuff away on their cars. But the couplers are already body mounted. So I just changed all the couplers to Katie. I never used the ones they give you. And the little air holes, I had to move that because the wheel was hitting that. Next. And when I moved the Roco ones, I used the quarter inch by one eighth by one eighth, and that fits right between the frame of the car. And that's usually where I put the screw. I use tubing, not not solid. That way, I already have a hole. And I glue that in there. Then I go and grind everything away. Question, answers? Nope. Next. And that's how it ends up before I start getting out a grinder. I drill it, tap it. And I do all of that before I move, take the old bolster off. That way I can always get the truck exactly where it has to be. These were a friend of mine in Indianapolis. He was having a problem with his, and I said, well, I'll take them home and do them for you. But since then, he's bought like 10 more, and I keep a, avoiding him so I don't have to do it. <laughs> Next. That's after I got the grinder out. <laughs> That's how much I had to grind away in order to get the truck to turn the way I wanted it. Kind of looks pretty yucky right there, but the cars will run real good. Next. You can see a lot of that detail is gone. And what it is, is the, the wheels actually hit the frame more so than the, you know, the truck itself. And if you have any problem when you grind it too much away, just use those little, you know, the bolster heights and everything. Just use the KD washer to shim it up the way you want it. Next. And this is how I do the Rapido cars. It's a little different because of the way the truck is made. You have to use a different kind of plastic as far as the width wise. So every, every car, you know, passenger car, they all have different bolsters on the truck. So you have to modify the plastic to fit the car, fit, fit, fit the truck. 
Ron, do you um, just CA the plastic that you create there for the new bolster? Yeah. Well, you see, I try to get it as close as I can to the outside axle. Like I say, it usually averages out to be pretty close to a half inch you're moving it to the outside of this car. Don't seem like much, but what, when you move the pivot point, what it ends up doing is bringing the, out the middle of the car, it'll come closer to the track next to it. So you have a little more overhang on the middle than you do on the ends. But for operation wise, moving the pivot point just makes a big, big difference, I think anyway. Next. This is an S gauge car. I built an S gauge layout for a guy and he's having the same problem. So to do his, I had to add all of this plastic to move the pivot point. You see where the old bolster was compared to the new one. Then, you know, they all have telgo mounted couplers. So I cut all of those off and body mount all of those too. Next. Then they have a truck that is kind of sloppy. So I threw a piece of plastic on there to stabilize it so the truck don't really move a lot. Because I found moving the pivot point on the truck itself, the truck didn't stay flat on the rail. So I just glue them all together. But I know it worked. Since then, I've come up with another way for the coupler. I'll have to. I haven't put this in the clinic because I just figured out how to do it a little while ago. Next. And this is, uh, what is this? Oh, this is still, I don't know what car this is. Oh, it's still the same car. This is the heavyweight passenger car, which they're a little bit different than the streamlined cars, but the trucks are kind of the same. You see where I moved the new hole compared to the old one. Nice cool plastic on there. What you can do sometime if you're doing a certain car and you have a little problem with it, just take a little piece of lead or something and stick it on the far end on the right hand side to put a little more weight on the wheel itself, keep it down flat. Next one. Next one. And this is how I do it before I start to even do anything. I get a general idea where I can put the hole before while it's still mounted on the car. Next. So I fill in between the frame so I have a good solid piece there to screw everything to. If you have a car that's really thin floor, just put a piece of plastic on the inside of the car so you have something for the screw to bite into. Next. This is all his cars, not all of them, but some of them. And that's how it ends up before I mount the truck. This, this would apply to HO, OK. Basically anything you want to do as far as scale wise. I haven't done no end gauge yet, but I'm going to do them. I just haven't got to them yet. And still, I, I have an S gauge passenger train I'm doing for the Michigan S gaugers. And because I belong to that society too. So I moved all the trucks on that, and I was having a problem with the couplers. So I come up with a different way to mount your couplers and everything. Next. This is all the S gauge trucks after I got them all done. Next. So if you're running a railroad, you don't want it to end up like this. See, they didn't bother to move the pivot point, so that's why they had all the problem. See, they left the they left the pin in the middle of the truck. I tried to tell them they, they should do it this way, but they wouldn't listen. Next. 
And another thing is it's surprising how many people don't know how to gauge a wheel. You know, if you look on the NMRA gauge and it tells you exactly how to do it, but most people better never look at it. I know Ken Chick was over there one day and he was checking the wheels and he just dropped the gauge down. I said, well, you've been doing it wrong. He said, I've been doing it like this for 20 years. I said, well, you've been doing it wrong for 20 years. So I said, the way you check a wheel is you push the flange against one side, then you drop the wheel down. You don't just set it in there. You drop it down because you can see this wheel's out of gauge. Next. And the coupler heights, you know, uh, if you have the correct height on a coupler, you should not have to bend that glad hand. I found that out. I won $5 off my buddy that way because he was doing a clinic on couplers. And I got a car from him and I had to move. The glad hand was all bent. And I said, why'd you bend the glad hand? He said, well, the couplers were wrong. I said, no, you shouldn't have to bend the glad hand. Yeah, you do. So anyway, I got out a brand new and put it in there and adjusted the coupler. And I said, well, you were wrong. So I got my $5. Next. <clears throat> this is what I was talking about with the uh, wheels, axles. See if you have a, an axle that is tapered and you put it into a journal that is tapered. And if the wheel will move sideways because it's tapered, the wheel will go up and down. So if it's set in the journal correctly, like the bottom, the wheel can't move sideways. And that keeps the car dead center of the rail. Why do you think the real railroads can push a 100 car train backwards and it don't come off? because the wheels don't move sideways. Took me a long time to figure that one out. I spent a lot of money before it dawned on me what was going on. I mean, thousands of dollars because I was buying trucks and wheels. And every time I'd buy them, I'd buy enough for 500 cars. And that got very expensive real quick. But anyway, any questions on that? Guess not. What's the fix if if you're getting slopped, do you buy new new wheel, new axles? I do. I went through, I bought, when I first started, I bought all KD wheels. They were sloppier than whatever, but you know, they were a metal wheel and they're like, like they're great. So that didn't work out. So I said, well, it must be the wheel. So I went and bought all KD trucks. So I said, well, I bought 500 pair of those, put those all on the car. And I was still having problems. So I said, well, it must be the wheels. So I went and bought Northwest Short Line wheels. So I bought 2,000 of those. Changed all the wheels in the Katy trucks. Still didn't work. So one day I was sitting, I called the porch where it goes down the stairs. I got an opening in the wall. I was sitting there pushing the train backwards after I'd done all of this. And the cars were leaning to the side when I was pushing it backwards. So, you know, like everyone else, I just thought the truck was loose. So I went and got the car, took it in the workroom, tightened the truck up, put it back on the rail, and it still did it. So then I got, I ended up getting all my Atlas cars, all my Lifelike cars, and I put them all in one train, which was probably 60 cars. And I shoved it around the railroad backwards, and none of the cars come off. So I took the trucks, and I looked at the trucks, and I says, the wheels don't move side to side on the truck. They stay in the middle. So then I called up Atlas and I said, uh, I need to buy some trucks from you because their trucks, the axles didn't move in the journals. So he said, well, how many would you like? And I said, well, how many do you have? And they said, they have 510. And I said, I'd take them all. And the guy said, no, I can't give them all to you. He just sold me 500 pair. So I changed out the whole truck. So when I changed out all the trucks, I never weight my cars. I just leave them on a the rail. I got a little Ulrich car, flat car. That weighs one and a half ounces. I can put that car anywhere in any train and it will not come off because it stays in the center of the track. And everybody didn't believe me. So I put it behind the engine and shoved the 60 car train around the layout backwards and the car never come off. I pulled it around forward, the car never come off. I said, there's 
there's your answer. And people I argue with me and say, no, the car rolled real good. I never had a car that didn't roll good. It would shift. So that was the reason I changed all my trucks. So that's the first thing I check when I buy a car today. Today, you can buy cars that are done very well. They have no side slop in the truck whatsoever, like Intermountain makes a good truck. But I do in the older period, so most Intermountain stuff is pretty modern. But anyway, if you have a car that's coming off, look at that passenger car, freight car, it don't matter. So look at that. You'll see that a lot of times that's your problem. Nothing to do with the car weight or anything. It's just too much side slop in the wheels. Next. And I weigh the cars. All my passenger cars all weigh exactly the same. I don't care how long they are or anything. So I weighed it one up. It was five ounces. So I just weighed everything to five ounces. Next, check the motion of the truck. Next, make sure that it goes forward and backwards towards the center. That makes a big difference. I found that if you don't check that, that wheel that's closest to the end of the car, a lot of times when you tighten it up, that wheel will just stick up a little bit and if you go around a curve, it'll come off and you'll think it's the weight of the car. So you'll add weight to it and everything like that. But it's really just a truck isn't set dead flat and the truck won't move down in the front. So you have to make sure that it moves forward and backwards past center. Next. And you have to make sure it goes side to side as well. They didn't do that. So you see what happened to her train. So, and next, I think that's about it. Yep. Yeah. And you can see where I changed all the colors to fall. Next. That's the last one. So all this stuff was all added after my rail was built. When me and my buddy was doing it, I had no bridges. We were sitting up there and I said, well, we should put some bridges in there. So come down the next day and cut it all out, put those in there. Next. It's the last one. I think you muted me. You lost it? No, it's the last slide. Oh, there's one more that says the end. Oh, yeah, okay. And that's the end. This is my Susquehanna yard. It's not a yard, it's just an engine facility, but Anyway, any questions? I, I do have a comment, but very enjoyable, by the way. A lot of good information. Go too fast. Pardon me? I go too fast. No, no, not at all. Um, uh, the, the one comment I've got is uh, a lot of us buy Intermountain uh, wheel set, uh, metal wheel sets um, for uh, the Athern car, all well, the different cars we have. And I've noticed that a lot of Athern trucks are a little wider than, um, or maybe I should say the Intermountain axles are a little narrower than the Athern axles that come with the plastic wheels. And uh, you can get some Athern cars that lean pretty bad uh, because of that, because they're too narrow. I did hey, you find- don't, You don't think about it when you're looking at the car, you just figured, oh, well. You know, but if the car leans one way or the other, it's already going to fall off the track. Right, right. So, um, but one thing I did find out was the Accurail trucks yeah. are um, are excellent with the Intermountain wheels that I've tested, that I've seen. And you can buy um, in uh, bulk from Intermountain. They can be black, they can be brown, you know, different colors and different style of trucks. So if you've got Athern trucks that are giving you a lot of trouble, you can uh, you know buy some Inner Mountains and just use them to upgrade the Athern cars. Oh, I just got to the point I just changed out. I, I bought a lot of Atlas trucks way back when they were cheap. I think the first time I bought them, I got them for like two and two fifty. Then they went up to three seventy five. Then they went up to six seventy five. I think now they're up to like eight dollars a pair. 
Wow. But I used to tell my buddies, you know, I'd buy a couple hundred pair at a time. And they're like, why are you buying so many? And I said, well, when you're building an empire, you need a lot of trucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. 